Welcome to the Animal Training Fundamentals Podcast, where we have fun with practical application and we get mental with the science of behavior. Put them both together and you get results. Solutions for your behavior problems and the tools you need to achieve your training goals. I'm your host, Barbara Heidenreich. Let's talk training. Hey guys, it's Barbara Heidenreich and I've got another incredible interview for you. I feel so lucky. I know some really awesome people in the animal training world and I get to share with you all the cool things they've done. And this week is no exception because I have a trainer who's done something that so many people out here wish they have done and he's going to share with you all his secrets. How lucky are we? So let me get into that interview. But before we do, I am going to answer one of your questions at the end of this podcast. This time, it's going to be about how to get quick response to the cue. I got a few tips for you. And I also wanted to remind you, hey, if you've been liking this podcast, I know a lot of you love that interview I did with Dr. Joe Lang last time. Definitely rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. The more feedback we get from you, the more it helps other people find the podcast so more people can enjoy it just like you are. So I really appreciate your fabulous reviews. All right, let's get into this interview. Hey, it's Barbara Heinreich, and I have a special guest with me today. It's Henrik Futrup. Did I say it right? Yeah. Kind of? Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> he's a keeper I've known for a long time from the Copenhagen Zoo, and a keeper that oversees quite a few different animals, one of the largest sections at the zoo there. But the reason I love talking with Henrik is he's done some training that so many people would love to do, and some of you may have seen some videos that I've featured of his training in the past, and so you guys today are going to learn the secret of how he's done some amazing training at the zoo, but I'm not going to tell you what it is just yet, because first, we're going to have Henrik tell us a little bit about his background. So first, well, let me just say welcome. Welcome, Henrik. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh, your background, about, about how you got into animal training. When I started at the zoo in Copenhagen, it was um, I was working with the carnivores, uh, polar bears, uh, brown bears, and wolves, and that was actually my first training experience. And then um, I had uh, Anita, as you Anita Pilsen, our training coordinator, as my mentor, and she was at that time working in the sea lion department, and she was just up helping me with the polar bears training and then one day they came and asked if I didn't want to move to their section so I moved to the sea lion uh, department and then it just went on from there with sea lion training, penguins, aviary training, um, harbor seals, yeah you name it. <laughs> but it so, seems like like the aviary became a special interest for you didn't it? Yeah it did. That was for welfare reasons, because in Denmark, we have some very cold winters. And some of the birds, they couldn't be out during the whole year. So I was like, it can't be fun for, for example, black neck stilts to walk indoor for a couple of months a year. So instead, I thought that why don't do some recall training so we could get them indoor when we needed to and it all started in 2014 and it's just went on from there so first it was just said to be the the black neck stilts because they were the only species in the aviary that had temperature problems with the winter all of them except ducks are they're the last species that are missing up there Tell us a little bit about this aviary. What, what does it look like? It's, it's how, how big, would you say? It's quite large. It's by the entrance of the zoo, and it has, um, it's a walkthrough area for the public. So we have this path through the aviary, and then in the back, we have the house. So when you're a visitor, you will stand looking over to the house that is with the windows on the front so we have more lighting in for um, so we can start breeding season 
slightly earlier than if we were having it all cooped up. So we roughly have about 150 birds in the aviary, and it's divided into uh, seven species. So we have black neck stilts, scarlet ibis, black-faced ibis, Caribbean flamingos, and Inca terns. And then we have two kinds of ducks. I won't say one of them because I can't say the English word for it. <laughs> oh, you can say it in, in, in Danish. <laughs> Chile pibe and ring teals. So if people haven't figured it out yet, you've basically trained how many of those species to recall inside, but they each have their separate recall cues. Is that correct? Yeah, the only two that are two duck species that haven't been trained. So the rest of them, they have their own recall for their own specific indoor enclosure. And we have on the side of the house, we have a little extra building for Dalmatian pelicans that they are out on an open lake. They are old birds, so they are wing clipped. They can't fly away, but we had birds that had full wings. So they were trained to come in and we could close the gate. We could catch the birds and cut the feathers on those two birds that had full wings. And then we could let them out again and they couldn't fly away. Prior to that, before the training started, Aneta, she's probably shown it a lot of times, video of how it looked when a lot of keepers tried to catch some Dalmatian pelicans out on the lake. The amount of keepers that were used of people when you put that into hours, it was the same as eight full working days of uh, keepers that to catch those birds and a lot of equipment to get them in. So after that, they were just, you could just, um, we had this uh, soda bottle with small pebbles in. So you will give that a shake and then the pelicans, they would come sailing into the house and you could close the gate, catch the birds, cut the feathers, let them out and call them in again. And that probably takes all of, what, 10 minutes maybe? <laughs> to call them yeah. in at least. <laughs> yeah, five to 10 minutes, and then it's uh, it's all done. Yeah, amazing. I, I love that example because one of the things that I often want to say about animal training to zoo professionals or the people that are in management who need to know that animal training saves them money because when you talk about how many days and people that it took to do it the old way that's a lot of yeah. money in investing. it is and here it's just a little bit of time to get that job done and that saves them money in the long run if they want to think dollars and cents when it comes to animal training even though we're often thinking about animal welfare too yeah so how do you get a behavior like that started? That's what the animal trainers want to know. With the stilts, they were the first species that we started with. And they were very shy. None of the birds have been hand-reared or anything in the aviary. So it's not like they're coming up to the keepers like, hey, you got some food or anything? It's like, nah, I don't want to come near you. And if you come into the house... I'll go out of the house, and if you go outside, I'll go inside. So it was all, always that. With the stilts, it was like a, a thought that if we meet you where you feel safe, and then we begin our training there, and where they felt safe, safe that was out in the Avery. So uh, what we did at that time, that was walk as close to the birds as they would allow, and then we had this little bell that we would ring and when the birds then looked at us we would then throw them some worms and then so forward you just take small steps all the time you just walk slightly shorter uh, not as close to them and then you want them to move towards you and then you build it on and on until you stand by the gate and that was the tricky part with the gate because you can't go from the Avery and direct into the house. So you had to run all around the house to get indoors. So when we came to that point, it was that you would get the birds, you would stand by the gate outside, ring the bell. The birds would then come running. You could throw a few worms and then you could 
run around the house and indoor, and then you give the ring again, and then throw some worms out of the door hole. And the birds, they were like putting two and two together, that it was that way. And then in the end, we were standing on our service area in the house. And then the, the birds indoor enclosure, that was free. So they didn't feel threatened by us. And you would give the ring. And then, yeah, one came in, two came in. And in the end, we had six birds in as we had at that time. Then the next part, that was the gate. Because as we know, most of us keepers, we tend to have that thing that, ooh, they ain't, we'll just smack the gate in and then it's done. But the cool part was that the gates up in this house, they're electrical and they're very slow. So <laughs> you uh, had to uh, control your patience because it was in the bird's speed in their pace, what they would accept. So you could just close the gate slowly. And as soon as one of the birds showed signs that it wanted to go out, we would just open the gate again. So we gave them sort of the remote control to the gate and said, it's like, you come in, we'll close the gate. If you don't want to be here, I'll open the gate and then you can walk out again. So in that way, it actually went quite fast for them to come in and in the end we could close the gate give them some worms and then we'll open the gate again and then as time went on we could just make the period longer and longer and then we started to put on more criteria. the indoor enclosures we have this little ramp all around land area and then it's one big pool so we wanted the birds to, before they got their reward, we would want them to go down into the pool and then they would get the reward and then we would close the gate. So it's a lot of steps to come to the end. And that's actually how it was built with most of the species up in that house. Just slightly different from how the different birds reacted. Did you ever have problems of some of the some different species trying to go in with other species since they would oh. probably eat the same things? You know, a lot of mixed species aviaries, like, you know, the ibis one eat the mealworms just like the stilts want to eat the mealworms. Yeah. There are actually some measures you can take already um, outdoor in the aviary. So all the entrance areas you can make them in a way so that they will minimize one species from going in because they don't feel safe because either it's too cramped with bush and trees and other stuff so they don't feel safe going in there or you could for other species for the stilts it is they don't like things flying around over their head so for them it was that we would plant trees and grass outside on each of the sides of the gate. And that made them feel more safe about being in that area. But for some of the other species, it was like they, they like to have a full view of the area, but they couldn't have because they feel like cooped up in that little area. So that, that minimized some of the, the species from going towards that gate and it will increase other species to go towards the gate because they like that surrounding. For example, the, the Inca terns, they like to have a full view. I'll just put in a little footnote because the Inca terns, they're like, they're like the badass in the Avery. So if I should, if we should have done anything differently in the, sense of what species we would take out of the area to start with then it would be the Inca terns because they're quite annoying but they like to have like an open view and they like to have that they can see everything in the indoor enclosure so with them it's just full open up by their gate and that gives them the sense they can just come flying by and then they have a full view of the indoor area 
So it's like they can see there isn't any boogeyman standing in there trying to catch them, so they'll just fly in. So that's the first step you can do. You can create the area around your gates towards what is it that the different species like. For example, it doesn't give any sense to have a ground living species, have them walk into the, the second floor. Of course, it gives sense to have them to walk in downstairs and, and the birds that likes to fly up in the air, it gives sense to have their gate up on the second floor so they'll fly in. So how do you keep the birds motivated to participate? Is there food out all day long for them? Instead of just putting in the food in the morning, we give them a portion in the morning and then we use their food for trainings, for recall sessions during the day. So in that way, you get more things because instead of having birds that are just like sitting around in a corner, just waiting, either because they are full, they have eaten everything, you have birds that are like, they're curious. They want to investigate the area and we don't run them on hunger. And it's not, if you don't participate, we'll cut off your food. It's not like that. We just take the food and spread it out during the whole day. In that way, you also, I think, have a more natural way of living for the birds instead of just getting a bowl in the morning and a bowl in the, in the evening. And that's like your day. So you have the enrichment part put in too in this way because you, the birds have, they never know when the session is. And so it's like they're always in a way alert depending on which season you are in of the year. And then you asked about the, with the, the species that were eating some of the same food. For example, the Inca terns like to eat the same fish that the scarlet ibis get. So when we started, it was stilts. Inca turned scarlet ibis. That was the way that, so we took one species, learned them their recall. Then we took another species, learned them their recall and another and another. So that we didn't, when you put too many balls up in the air, sometimes you'll mix it up and you'll just get like a blurred picture. So for this way, it was easier for, the, for all of us keepers, but it was also easy for the birds to understand. So, with the food, the Inca turns, they learned that why should I come for my recall when there's a bowl of food standing in the next room that I could just, that's for free. I don't have to do anything. I can take it at what time fits me. So we built these little mesh boxes. So it's just like small wood frame. And then we have different mesh types depending on which species it's, it's for. For example, the black neck stilts. They have like a very small mess size because they have like a long, very thin beak. So they, they can, we can put their food in in the morning. And we do that, uh, especially in the breeding season. So they always have food for chicks and stuff like that. So they can go in and they can eat their food and they can come for the mealworms when they want to participate. And, but the Inca turns can't eat their food and the scarlet ibis can't take their food. And the same we did with the scarlet ibis, just larger mess size. So the Inca turns, they couldn't go in there and eat the food. They then figured out that they could actually, sometimes when the Inca scarlet ibis, they have been eating, then some of the fish would be pulled up through the mesh. And then the Inca turns just figured out, we can just sit and wait until they have been eating something and then we can have a meal. So what we did was that, they get pellets, they get clams, mussel meat, and um, sprats. So what we did was that we took the, the mussel meat and the sprats, put it into a blender, blended it up, mixed it up with their pellets. So the ibis thinks it's cool to stand with the beak and poke in, the, in that porridge. But the Inca turns, they're like, I'm not going to eat that thing. So that's like the things that we have done to prevent other species from going into other species stables. And the same with the ibis, they went into the Inca turns 
if we would leave food in there. So what we do with the Inca terns is we'll go up, do a recall, we'll feed them until they don't want to have any more food, and then we'll take the rest out if they are. Normally they eat it up and then they fly away because they don't want to eat more. So the scarlet ibis don't have a reason to go into their stable. So you don't you just pull away the reason for going into a stable because we know that if the scarlet ibis always know we can just go in here and there'll be some food, then they have a reason to go in there and they'll do it because sometimes there'll be food and yeah, sometimes they won't, but they will definitely learn that there will be at some point. So that's divide the food out the whole day and yeah, minimize the chances of that other species get rewarded for going into the different species stables because it gets quite annoying when you have the different birds in the wrong stables. I like those extra strategies that you've come up with to help maintain it. That's really important. How about what do you do if a bird doesn't participate so what if say one of those stilts in your group didn't come in it's their own choice they can participate or they can stay away they will still give get their uh, diet that they are set to have in a day so they have a set amount food amount as every species at the zoo has what they should have at a given time of the year they will still get that food even though that they don't participate so it's their choice so again they have the control they can decide i don't want to participate today but i'll still have my food i won't go hungry into bed and how hard is it to maintain the behavior throughout the year because i guess there are times when they do have to stay inside a little bit longer because the weather isn't so great yeah, I'll say that the hardest time to maintain the behaviors that is in the breeding season. So what we actually have at the zoo is we say that we have we have winter criteria and we have summer criteria. So when we are in the breeding season, we know that some of the species, for example, the the scarlet ibis, if they are on the nest, they won't come down for food. They'll come down for food when the mate comes out and changes with them so they don't leave the nest unless they are chased away so therefore in the summer period or the breeding season we lower our criteria and we we will lower maybe the amount of times that we ask for the behavior because as an editor you can also make white noise that the recalls they don't have a meaning because you just stand ringing with the belts uh, with the bell for the stilts they never come so they never get rewarded for it so in that way you will erase the meaning of the bell so in that way with the summer criteria they'll lower and then in the winter we will up them so for us it's actually perfect because in the summer time we don't need to have the birds in because most of the times in Denmark, we have very good weather in the summer and the birds, they can be out and the public is there. And in the winter period, when it's cold and some of them need to go in, then we up the criteria. And in that way, we have the birds in when we need them to be in. And didn't you work on another recall that was more for like a guest experience, as I recall? Yeah, we also, um, the one that you saw that was for the black neck stilts that we could call them over to the public. We can still do that. What we made it into is that we made it into a mutual call for all of the birds in the Avery. So when we have a public talk in the Avery, we um, can call all the birds down, the ones that want to participate, and then they get close to where we're standing talking about the birds and then we can talk about all the different beak sizes and shapes because they're up close to the public and they can see them and they can see the different uses of the beaks. So that's what we've done for like a mutual call for all the birds. Then the Inca terns, they have their own recall outside where we call them over and then we can stand in a crowd of public 
calling them and then they'll fly by and dive down and take the fish out of your hand. And in that way, the, the public gets that wow effect of the Inca terns flying by very close. And you can then again talk about how the birds they are designed when you have them like that. Do you think there was any species that was easier to train than any of the others in that group? The Inca terns, but that's also because that they're like, they're sort of like badasses. They're like annoying by nature. So they come, they're not like afraid of much. So they will come and they will come on the different birds we call to see if they can get some free food or anything. But they're also so clever that if they don't get anything it's with the different birds recall, then it's like they'll come, they'll look, okay, he's awake today, so I won't get anything. So I'll just sit here and watch, and most of the time they leave. But the black-faced ibis, they've been the hardest, and the flamingos. The flamingos, I think they have been so hard. That's because they have a long negative history. In the old exhibit where they, they live, they would be catched and put in for the winter. So they, they only think keepers, they're like very negative and they don't like to be, uh, be near us. But last end of summer, we actually had quite a good breakthrough with the flamingos. So with the flamingos, we've done it slightly different than with the other birds. So what we did was that we would give them a cue and that was that we went out into the aviary, started clapping in our hands and then we would walk around the lake. So in a way we would put pressure. So we told the birds that now we're going to put pressure on you by the clapping. So they knew every time that we would go out and do this clapping sound he would the keeper would put pressure onto us and the second that the birds started moving we would stop and then they would walk towards the gate but if they then stopped again then we would do the clapping and then put pressure on again so that was the way that the flamingos because we just couldn't couldn't crack the nut with them to get it in a positive way but now it's actually this last fall where the flamingos it was like we could stand in the indoor enclosure do the clapping and then go out through the house so we wouldn't so we walked away from the birds and out of their sight and then slowly the birds actually started to walk inside so now they have that they they can actually they it's still not a hundred percent there but it comes sounds very similar to what we were talking about with the constructional approach that you can teach with this sort of very benign uh, use of negative reinforcement that if you put a, a little tiny bit of this pressure and then when they give the right response you remove that and then they can learn that you can get the right response and then you can transition to positive reinforcement after that you know, so there could yeah. be good stuff waiting for them inside so. And they were they would get a bucket of krill every time they, they walked um, in. So well, yeah, there you go. So it eventually, yeah. like you said, you'll transition to there's no, there's just the clapping, and there you go. The whole thing comes down to that you have to maintain and be very strict as with every training. But there are times as the, of the year where it's like you just want to throw a hand grenade in the door and then close it because nothing works up there and that's because you're in the breeding season for example the black neck stilts they can chase away 62 flamingos they don't care because that's when they're in the breeding season so we have this we have like a year circle for all the species so we know what time of the years they start going off so there we will as we talked about earlier we lower our criteria so that we don't ruin it and if you just keep maintaining the work all year round even though that it seems very hopeless then you will have it much easier 
when you have to start up again in the fall. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's one of those good things to keep in mind because it's easy to show people things when everything is perfect. And so yeah. everybody has this notion that, oh, you know, it, it always looks like that all the time. But the truth about behavior is that it's always changing depending on all sorts of things, not just reinforcement, but like you're saying, the the context. So if it's breeding season, then that could be overpowering the reinforcers that you have to offer in the areas where they're supposed to shift. So all those things always matter. Good points to bring up for all those people out there that want to train all their birds to recall in the aviary. We actually had two keepers from Belgium to try and work with this training because they wanted to start it at their zoo. Of course, when you have people coming in and you want to show them, it's like you also want to show them <laughs> that it, it works. And what they saw was that in the beginning, it was like the first couple of days, nothing worked. It was like one, two birds of the different species came in. They got to see why it was important to keep going on and maintaining because slightly as the days go, they see that more and more birds get in. And then the last week they were there, it was like you had, you had what you wanted to show them. So that's quite good. Yeah, the process and, and how yeah. to keep it going and maintaining it. Let's see, are there any other things people should know who want to try this that we, we didn't discuss? Well, it sounds like enclosure design is really important. Thinking about the natural history of the species that you're working with, that it's not about deprivation. It's about how and when you deliver the food, making sure that they get, that the right species is getting access to what you want and you can manage that. Maybe training one flock at a time at first so that they each understand their behavior quite well instead of trying to do them all at the same time. Also try and figure out who are the most annoying birds in <laughs> your in your aviary uh -huh. because who are the or let's rephrase it, who are the more curious birds in your aviary because they that's most likely the species that will be the easiest to get to work with. And then They'll also be the species that are most likely the most annoying one that will ruin other training. So pull them out the first. So we have it uh, here at the zoo that when we come to the winter period and we want to have some of the birds in for night, it's like we take out Inca terns. They are the most annoying birds. Then we take the scarlet ibis because they... Uh, the ones the Inca turns they will ruin it for this for every other species because they can they'll come and annoy you all of the places and then if you take the scarlet ibis out they won't ruin it for the black-faced ibis and then we take the black-faced ibis because they won't ruin it for the stilts so the stilts are the one that are the lowest at that time so we take them in this route every day that also gives the bird, they know what's going to happen at that time. So they know somewhere after three o'clock, the keepers, they will start calling in some of the species and they know which, which setup we're going to take them in and um, they'll be ready. And for us, it's very important that the birds, they're ready and they know what's going to happen because if we don't get the birds in, you just have like extra hours, for example, or you can't get a species in for night. And we actually had, before all of the species in the Avery, they were trained. We had the Avery collapsed one winter because of snowfall. And the birds, they were, they were out in the Avery. But the keepers that came in, they could do the recall. And most of the birds, they actually got in. There were a few birds that we had to go out and catch by net out in the aviary because yeah they just couldn't find their way through all the mesh but most of the, sp the birds they actually got in with their recall wow the same we we have tried it when it's an emergency because after that the aviary collapsed it was sort of like stitched back together and then we had to change all the mesh so all the birds they were called in they had to be closed in for a period. 
But what happened was one day when I was standing uh, cleaning indoor, one of the gates just went open by itself. And I was like, it was the Inca turn. So that one was forced, <laughs> forced closed again. And then you just, you just see out of the, the corner of your eye that Ibis didn't stop by the gate. So it's just like running through all the, the Avery's indoor and then closing the gate. And it was like, it was just one bird. And I knew that all the mesh was off the Avery outside. And then I go outside. I was like, it's not just one bird. <laughs> it was like 14 birds. And some of them were sitting on top of the, of the Avery. We had a lift inside the Avery. So we did the recall. And actually, there were only two birds that we didn't catch or we didn't get in on the recall. Those birds we had to catch by net. Wow, that's amazing. They have tried it in a hard situation. <laughs> wow, wow, congratulations. That's, a, that's yeah. a good, good, good success story. Well, beyond good, that's an excellent success story. Well, there you go. That's, yeah. That in itself is a reason to train recall. <laughs> Definitely is. <laughs> I don't know if we should even try to top ending our conversation on that because that's pretty awesome. <laughs> so yeah. are there are there other keepers that you work with that you would like to acknowledge that help you yeah. train all these cool behaviors? Definitely there is. We have in our section we have five keepers. So we have Christopher and Nikolai and Reike and Ellen in our section and they are all there to maintain this behavior and keeping it going. And that's important. And of mm -hmm. course want to thank the zoo for letting us get the manpower to do it. Well, thank you so much for doing this interview, Henrik. I think there are a lot of bird trainers and keepers out there that are super envious of what you have accomplished. And I hope they will be inspired by this interview because you have shown it can be done. So thank you again for sharing your knowledge with us. You're welcome. I just have one thing and that's just to make me don't forget because yep. I promised both you and Aneta yes. that we would write something about this. Yes. Yeah. So now it's all out of, over the world. So now we have to get it done. And that counts Aneta too, that we will get it done. Okay, great. Well, you definitely get in touch with me when you have it in writing and mm -hmm. let us know where it will be available. And we will make sure to add that to this episode webpage so we can tell people where to find it. Super. All right. And we'll share some video clips, right? You have video clips that we can share on the episode webpage as well? Yeah. And I know I have some. If you give me permission, yeah. I, will, I will put them on here as well. So people can see what this beautiful aviary looks like and some examples of the shifting and recall behavior that you have trained. So again, thank you, Henry. Thank you. I hope you got some great tips from that interview. I love visiting that aviary and seeing all those fabulous birds recall trained. I know it's a dream for a lot of you bird keepers out there. And there you go. It's possible. You can do it. Henrik has done it. So therefore, there is no turning back. The gauntlet has been thrown. Time to train that behavior. All right, now it's time to move on to one of your questions. And this time it is a dog training question, but the truth is you can apply this to pretty much any behavior. And the question is, they want to know, they say they have two labs that are pretty well trained. However, we've moved to a rural area and they love running free, but they are not always so good at coming back when called. What advice do you have to entice them to return more quickly? All right, so to me, you know, we've just done a whole bunch of discussion about training a recall. So that's why I picked this particular question. And Henrik gave us a lot of great advice about training recalls in general. But one of the things that we didn't really talk about is how do you teach quick response to the cue? How do you get past that latency issue? So let's talk about some things that you can do to address latency. So one of the things that can create latent performance of behavior is not really including quick response to the cue as part of your training criteria. So usually the way that I address this is I start really short and use really high value reinforcers. And I try to cue the animal when I think the animal's like 99.9% .9 sure going to respond to my cue 
right away. And that way I'm making quick response to the queue part of my criteria right from the get-go. I wanna avoid doing things like queuing over and over and over again. I wanna kinda make it so that I queue one time and the animal comes right away and I get to reinforce heavily for that. I also want to get away from doing things like showing what I have. I want to make sure that the animal is really responding to my cue, not getting into that that kind of trap of having to see what kind of good things they're going to get. I want to cue when the animal's ready. I don't. I work up to situations where the animal's going to be recalling under distraction. So that's something that you're going to do gradually. You're going to gradually add those distractions. And so I'm not going to cue when conditions are not good. I'm also going to try and do this, practice this at a time when the animal's really attentive and interested in what I have to offer as a reinforcer. So that means picking a good time to have my training sessions. You know, So maybe we're going to practice before mealtime. And I'm also going to think about those demand functions, right? So if that animal gives me a really good response, man, he's going to get so much of that good stuff so that he knows quick response is what I want. And that's what's going to earn you all the goodies. Now, if I do call and the animal doesn't respond right away, what am I going to do? Well, I'm probably going to pause for a moment. And if need be, I'm going to try and relax my criteria so that I do get quick response. And so that the animal learns that quick response is part of the behavior. And that's what earns you all the goodies. And another way you can think about this is that quick response to the cue is a concept and you might need to generalize it. So it might be something that you want to practice with all the behaviors that your animal knows so so that your animal learns that quick response should be part of the criteria for anything that you ask your animal to do. So those are a few strategies you might want to apply to your recall behavior. And again, a big part of this is starting under conditions in which your animal can be successful and then gradually working up to those conditions in which it's going to be more more challenging before you take it out into that big giant field with all of those distractions. Gradually make it so that your animal can be super, super successful in easy conditions and then make it a little bit tougher. All right. I hope that gives you some suggestions that you can use. And I look forward to talking to you about training next time. Remember, rate, review, subscribe, and help other training enthusiasts enjoy this podcast as well. Talk to you later. If you liked what you heard today, visit AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com for more quality content on animal training. You'll find courses, community, and extensive video examples from my consulting work around the world. We'd love to have you join our force-free family.